looks like we have most of the registered class members here. And because we do want to set a precedent that we're going to start on time each day, we're going to go ahead and get kicked off. And I believe we have Professor Dweck. So with his blessing, if he's here, wonderful. I'm going to start his introduction. And then we will pass the baton to Professor Dweck for his uh, lecture. So thank you to the class. Uh, you're returning to operating in a lunar environment. This is our second class week. Professor Dweck, who will be kicking off the lectures today, is the faculty director of the Engineering Systems Laboratory in the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics. He brings deep expertise in space logistics and mission formulation and mission work and systems, a topic that he's going to cover for the class today. He was also, as some of you may not know, an officer in the Swiss Air Force, which I really appreciate. Both of my parents were Air Force officers, and recently a senior vice president for technology planning and road mapping at Airbus from 2016 to 2018. So we're quite fortunate to have his time today. And with that, um, Jeff, if you want to add anything, we can also let Professor Dweck begin. No, um, I, I think. Um, um... Professor Dweck's qualifications will become very apparent once he starts to speak to us. So I'll not take any of his time. Jeff, I have a picture. My last slide here is a picture of you from a long time ago that you will recognize. Oh, OK. <laughs> uh, so let me start. So um, you had a pre-reading called SpaceNet. I hope you had a chance to look at that. But I want to expand a little bit uh, just uh, beyond that to give a big picture here. Um, on my view on space logistics. And it, it's, it's good timing because I gave, I gave a version of this lecture about a week ago um, at, a, at a workshop that was organized uh, by EPFL in Switzerland called Sustainable Space Logistics. So it's a topic that's become more inter of more interest again. And I call it, the subtitle is Enabler of the Final Frontier, 1960 to 20, 2060. And so I want to take you back to actually not lunar exploration, but Antarctic exploration. So, uh, you know, roughly 100 years ago, the fact that we would step foot on the moon was uh, absolutely science fiction. You know, Jules Verne said we would do that, but um, who believed it? So, but what was going on was, was uh, Antarctic exploration. Antarctica was the moon of the early 20th century. That's another way to say it. Uh, one of the most famous expeditions is Shackleton's uh, Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition from 1914 to 1916. Um, and this was a failed expedition. They did not achieve their goal. Um, why did they do this expedition? Well, basically because the South Pole had already been reached by Amundsen. So what was left was to cross the Antarctic continent. They had an ingenious scheme, which in theory sounded very good. Two separate parties, uh, the Weddell party with a ship called the Endurance. Um, and then uh, that, that, that one has uh, been, of course, highly publicized because that's the one that, that Shackleton was on himself. And then the Ross party, much less well known, uh, coming from the other side of the continent. So you see the Ross Sea here below. And their goal, their task was to go to the South Pole and then put caches every one degree, every 60 nautical miles to put a cache of supplies. So when uh, Shackleton and his team would come from the other side, they could, they could on the backside have supplies every 60 nautical miles. This failed for multiple reasons, uh, including poor logistics planning, no communications. So um, it's really tragic. Shackleton had already failed, but they, they actually, the Ross party managed to put down these caches but there was nobody to actually come through and, and use them. Uh, and there was no communications and also very poor physical preparation um, of the British expeditions compared to the Norwegians that had a very different strategy, very fast, very lightweight, uh, with very, very fit uh, uh, members. So uh, if you want to know more about this, Shackleton's Lost Men is a fantastic book that explains what happened. Um, there's yeah, another... I, I yeah. That although Shackleton didn't, 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 none of Shackleton's men died, uh, there was at least one person who died from the Ross side. Is that, isn't that right? Yeah, they, uh, there, there was more than one, I think, but yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So, so, um, so those deaths were avoidable because, you know, the, the supplies were never used, basically. So, 
There's another really cool book that I recommend, 1986, um, Peter Beck, The International Politics of Antarctica. And I'm just going to quote this, uh, Antarctic science is dependent on logistics and the ability to place and maintain scientists and their equipment in the right place at the right time. After 1925, the development of mechanized transport, the airplane, radio, and technology um, made access to Antarctica and survival in the hostile environment much less difficult. And so <clears throat> some time ago, I tried to um, basically write down all of the Antarctic expeditions that I could find and, uh, and make this graph here that shows you on the y-axis just the number, cumulative number of Antarctic expeditions and then uh, some milestones. Um, so you had, it starts roughly in the 1820s with really just coastal, coastal exploration. Um, and then there's not much between 1840 and 1890. So there's like a 50 year quiescent period. And then we have what's often called the heroic age of Antarctic exploration. 1911, Amundsen reaches the South Pole. Um, and, and then 1925 is the date mentioned by Beck. And you can see, indeed, after 1925, uh, the number of expeditions goes up a lot because we have the airplane, because we have logistics, and we have technology. And then the graph sort of stops in 1957, which is the International Geophysical Year, and, and this is where the handoff happens to space. <laughs> so 1957, Sputnik, and that's where you get your 1960 to 2060 timeline. Um, so... Where are we today? 2021, so the red line you see on the bottom. So we've, we've done Apollo. Uh, we've done, I think, the Space Shuttle era, Skylab, Mir. Tiangong-1 the, the, was the first Chinese space station, which has re-entered in 2018. The ISS is still operating. And the question then is, what's next? Well, what's next? Excuse me. Let me just go back here. Uh, what's next is Artemis, Lunar Village, um, Mars base and so forth. So there's, there's a lot of appetite to go beyond, but um, also a lot of questions of how to best do it and how to best use the, the lessons learned. Um, so what I'd like to do in the next few minutes is just tell you about um, the challenges of space logistics and compare that with terrestrial logistics. Some of the contributions of our research group here at MIT on these problems and then since Jeff is here, I feel like he's the one who should tell you about MOXIE, but I'll, I'll say a few words because I do think it's a very important, it's a very important experiment and a, and a pathfinder for the future. So um, space logistics, uh, what is the definition of space logistics? Space logistics is the theory and practice of driving space system design for operability and of managing the flow of material, so physical things like um, consumables, spare parts, fuel, etc., services and information needed throughout the space system life cycle. And believe it or not, but the AIAA, the American Institute for Aeronautics and Astronautics, which is our main professional society, um, has, uh, they have a bunch of technical committees, about 60 of them, and one of them is dedicated to space logistics. And I had the, the pleasure, the honor to chair this committee from 2008 to 2010. And what's interesting is originally that committee was just looking at, um, you know, space logistics meant what happens at the, at the spaceport, at the launch pad. And clearly we're talking a much bigger picture here. That includes ISS resupply, future in-space refueling, campaign analysis, and also asset management which seems kind of mundane, but, but is a critical point. Um, so the question is, you know, uh, what can we learn from terrestrial supply chains? And I, I, I don't have to tell you how important terrestrial supply chains are. It's very obvious, especially now during the pandemic. I'm assuming most of you have ordered stuff from Amazon, had it delivered to your house. And so the, the amount of effort and technology and planning that goes into that in the background is absolutely enormous. Um, one of my former students is actually the head of the network research department at Amazon, and they do exactly the kind of research that you see here. Um, this is a software called LogicNet, which was just recently, well, first acquired by IBM and then by a company called LamaSoft, which is one of the leaders in um, terrestrial supply chain optimization. And so you can see on the left, 
uh, on the left panel, this is uh, supply chain network design. Where do you put your warehouses? Where are you manufacturing? Where are your customers? Those are the green dots. Your potential warehouses are the blue triangles. And then given an architecture of a supply chain, you can analyze it. You can simulate shipments. You can see the, um, the network here uh, attaching customers, mapping customers to specific warehouses. You can look at the trade-off between transportation costs, inventory levels, shipping times, and so forth. And so this is pretty, pretty advanced. And the question we asked you know, about 15 years ago was, can we create a similar planning environment, but not for Earth, but for space? And so that's, that's what I'll talk about next. And it's kind of surprising, but a lot of the same concepts apply. We have nodes and arcs in space, but instead of suppliers, manufacturers, distributors, we have launch sites, orbital nodes, depots, surface operations, uh, push-pull, supply and demand, and also the idea that whatever we do, it needs to be lean, modular, upgradable, easily maintainable. So the point is that while the specifics, uh, the specific details differ, um, some of the fundamental concepts absolutely remain valid in space. But there are differences and challenges. And so perhaps one of the biggest challenges is the time varying launch opportunities depending on where you go, whether it's the moon, um, Earth orbit, moon, Mars, the further away from Earth you go, the less frequent your launch opportunities will be, basically. This is, by the way, the famous uh, pork chop plots that some of you have n uh, heard about. Um, they're essentially a launch calendar computed, uh, in this case, between Earth and Mars. Uh, solving the famous uh, Lambert's problem, which is a boundary value problem. You know, we were departing the Earth on a particular date. We want to arrive at Mars at the correct date and not miss Mars. How much energy is required? So the contour plots you see here are the so-called C3D. That's the depart C3 departure energy, taking into account the escape velocity that you need to reach to actually get to Mars at the right time. Um, and it turns out, Jeff, uh, I'm assuming you remember well, Tuck, who's now at JPL, uh, we, we, we actually published this, this calendar of uh, uh, Earth-Mars um, launch opportunities between 2020 and 2040 some years ago. And um, it turns out that if you look at, at this picture here, we zoom in to 2020 to 2023, that, um, that, that lower picture here, that, that, that contour, the low energy contour, that's exactly the launch window that was used by the Mars 2020 mission and some of the other missions that have now arrived, like the UAE mission. Um, and, and so that, that launch was the 30th of July, 2020. And then you can simply um, follow this line, this diagonal line from the upper left to the lower right with time of flight. And, and we get exactly the, the arrival at, at Mars that we've seen last week. So we can't ship any time, like with DHL or, or FedEx or the Postal Service, you really have to time it right. And this, this imposes some constraints. Another big challenge in space logistics is uh, what I call nested complexity and object hierarchy. So all the words you see in, on this chart, pocket, container, drawer, SRU, uh, meaning shop replaceable unit, LRU is a line replaceable unit, MPLM is the multi-purpose logistics module, which was used on the sh space shuttle. It, basically, what I'm trying to tell you is that space logistics, current as we do it currently, is like Russian dolls. You package the actual supply items inside of bags, inside of racks, inside of a, a module, and then inside whatever the vehicle that you're transporting. Here it's shown these, the shuttle. Uh, we're using Cygnus now. Uh, we're using you know the ATV. Uh, the HTV and so forth. So we, we've, if you think of the shuttle as a truck, we replaced the truck by a whole bunch of pickup trucks. That's the, the best analogy that I, that I can give you. And um, we're doing this, of course, because this is extremely precious cargo and it needs to be protected from uh, vibrations and environmental impacts. Uh, so the downside of it is that the actual a uh, fraction of useful cargo is extremely low in space logistics. It's, it's like 
less than 1% of the launch mass. So the tar mass, the packaging, the vehicle around it uh, matters a lot. And so manifesting very carefully and trying to minimize the overhead is, is a big imperative. And then once you're in space, particularly in, in zero gravity, you, you find yourself in a, in, a, in a 3D situation where everything floats around. And, uh, you know, I have, I have trouble keeping track of my items in 2D. Uh, but once things start floating around in three dimensions, including air currents and so forth, it's surprisingly difficult to keep things in order and know where things are. And so asset management in microgravity is a huge challenge. Uh, on the ISS, for example, there's over 20,000 items that are being tracked. Traditionally, it's been a manual barcode-based system. Uh, we've actually done some experiments with uh, RFID. Um, this is a big job at the Johnson Space Center, the Russians as well. And it turns out that Russia and US are, are maintaining a joint IMS inventory management system. And if you squint really closely on this, on this screenshot here, you'll see both English and Cyrillic language used uh, for that system. So that, that's another big challenge. All right, so enough on the challenges. So some of the uh, research then contributions in recent years on, uh, on how do we actually think ahead? How do we plan not just an individual mission, but a, a, a string of missions or a campaign led us to, to formalize um, both a methodology and a software tool for doing this. And this is the one that you know, I'd like to offer up to the, to the lower class in this community today uh, called SpaceNet. Um, so SpaceNet is available. Uh, we haven't really touched the software very much in the last few years, to be honest. Um, but, but we do have uh, the ambition to kind of bring it back and upgrade it with, with, uh, with some of the new campaigns that have now been proposed. But in some sense, the, the logic behind it is pretty timeless. So what is it? It's the ability to model space exploration from a logistics perspective. It's fundamentally a discrete event simulation, and it allows you to evaluate and visualize campaigns. You can also do some limited optimization and trade space studies. So um, the building blocks of SpaceNet are nodes, like we saw in the logistics uh, diagrams. Uh, we have three types of nodes, surface nodes, orbital nodes, or Lagrange points. Uh, the objects that are flowing through the network are supply items, uh, elements, meaning vehicles or habitats, and then agents, which could be human or robotic agents. There's a network, but it's a time-expanded network because of the uh, time-dependent nature of the orbits that I discussed. Um, and so uh, you can travel edges on the surface, you have trajectories, and then flights, which are kind of a, an abstraction of trajectories. And then, of course, events. And what's really cool here is that uh, it turns out that you only need these five canonical events, create, transfer, remove, reconfigure, and demand to essentially model any campaign. So we haven't found a campaign yet that cannot be modeled by some combination of these five basic building block events. The way that SpaceNet works is that on the left, you have an event stack. So this is a set of events that, that need to happen to execute your mission or your campaign. The simulator reads these events and then alters the state of the system. So for example, you know, uh, landing on the moon, uh, offloading supplies, uh, obtaining supplies, uh, moving back up to low Earth orbit, to, to low lunar orbit, those would all be state changes in the system. Uh, EVA can also be modeled, extravehicular activities. And so you read the state and this may also add events to the stack that, that weren't there before. Uh, what's also important is that you don't treat mass as just fungible mass. Mass is specialized in terms of these classes of supply. So propellants and fuels, crew provision, spares, those things need to be kept um, separate because they all have different demand models and demand drivers. So this is what the, uh, what the interface looks like for SpaceNet. It's written in Java. Um, so it's, it's, you can use it on any platform. It is not cloud-based at present. So you do need to install the, um, the software on your machine. And it, it basically takes you through these, 
logical steps of defining your network, defining your missions, calculating the demands, manifesting, meaning which vehicle will carry what supplies. And then the last step is you can do a simulation of your mission, which will tell you whether the, uh, the, the, the mission or the campaign is actually feasible. Meaning, do you have enough propellant to execute all your maneuvers? Uh, are you at the right place at the right time? Um, do you have enough supplies to cre keep your crew alive and so forth? Do you have enough spares? So those things will be, um, and usually when you first define a mission or a campaign, uh, it's not feasible. There's always some hiccup or some problem, and it's an iterative process of finding the errors in your mission or campaign, and then close the, close the loop to make it feasible. Um, the other important thing is that when you, uh, when you plan and execute a space exploration mission or campaign, that you, um, you kind of quantify the goodness of it. So you need some figures of merit. Um, I just want to share with you a couple of them that I think are, are useful. So one is exploration capability, which in this case, so we're assuming here human exploration, but I, I suppose you could also uh, generalize it to robotic exploration. Um, this is the, the uh, product of mass delivered to the surface or to whatever node you're exploring multiplied by crew days or agent days. And so there's a trade-off between bringing a lot of mass, uh, you know, like scientific equipment, for example, uh, payloads, but not a lot of supplies to keep the crew alive. Or you could have um, a long endurance for the crew, but then you can bring less scientific equipment. And, and there's some combination of the two that will maximize exploration capability. And then relative exploration capability is exploration capability about not now normalized by, um, in this case, Apollo 17. So we're using Apollo 17 as the reference case because it's the last time we were on the moon with humans and Apollo 17 stretched the capabilities of the Apollo architecture to its limits. And you can see that on this picture, we have the rover, the flag, the instruments, three days, two astronauts, a challenging landing location. Uh, you know, every, every Band-Aid was counted in the medical kit. And so that's why we're using that as a reference. And now why does that matter? Because if you look at exploration capability on the y-axis and total launch mass, which is a proxy for mission or campaign cost on the x-axis, you can see where these different points fall. And so you can see that Apollo 11 and Apollo 17 had pretty much the same launch mass, very close, uh, but Apollo 17 was able to accomplish more in terms of exploration capability. So we basically went vertical here. Um, you can see some of the constellation, when the constellation program was ongoing, some of the planning for the sortie missions. So single sortie missions are on the lower left of this chart. And then you can do strings of sortie missions. Um, Apollo did that, six landings. Uh, uh, Constellation was proposing that. But the problem is that um, by doing strings of sortie missions, you never leave anything behind for a subsequent mission to use, right? So there's no way that you can uh, get past the relative exploration capability. You're on this relative exploration capability ISO line. The only way you can break out of that is by landing at the same place again and reusing um, elements, equipment, supplies that were left there by a prior mission. And, and that's what you see what the, here in this case, the Constellation Lunar Outpost, you know, would be able to create a 200 fold improvement because you're, you're, um, you're reusing things that were left behind. And I think the same is true for, for Artemis and perhaps Clips as well. So, What's going on here is a paradigm shift in human space exploration. Apollo, if you look at it at a very abstract level, looked like this. We have launch from one place on Earth, and then we go and visit these six different places on the lunar surface, and we come back, but we don't leave anything behind. ISS, um, this is the early ISS where we just had launches from Russia or Kazakhstan and Kennedy Space Center. Now we're actually launching from five different places. Is one node in space, 
and five launch sites on Earth. And this is what the future looks like. It's essentially a network. We continue to operate ISS, low Earth orbit. We want to go back to the moon doing both um, you know, an outpost or lunar village as well as sorties, and then eventually Mars. So it's a much more interesting and much more complex network. And so this brings up a ton of questions, some of which I think we've tried to answer through our research in the last 15 years, but there's a lot of open questions. What is the uh, preferred mode for campaign logistics between carry along, resupply, pre-positioning, um, especially after 2024? Uh, what are the demand drivers for human crews in terms of classes of supply? Um, and then I highlighted in red because this is really where I think a lot of the, the, the paradigm shift comes in is uh, what ECLIS, environmental control and life support in in situ resource utilization and propulsion technologies are the most critical. Basically, because of a lot of the things that I said, uh, particularly the very small launch fraction of useful mass, we, we cannot bring everything from Earth. We will have to learn how to live off the land and use local resources on the moon, on Mars, harvest the atmosphere, but you need technologies that are reliable to do that. And, you know, how do, from a strategic perspective, how do these key decisions interact? So just to show you some examples, and I think this is what the, Ariel, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is what the pre-reading was about, right? Yes, for SpaceNet. So, so the nice thing about SpaceNet is that it's kind of mission agnostic or campaign agnostic. Um, a lot of the tools and methods that are out there are very specific to a particular destination. But because we're, we're grounding ourselves here in fundamentals, um, it's very flexible. So these are four scenarios that we've looked at with, uh, with SpaceNet. One is the ISS resupply, which is really an impressive story. You know, we, the, it barely makes the news, right, when a Cygnus launches these days. But when you look at it in, in over the 20 years, there's been, um, I think, over 200 missions now to build and resupply and um, do the crew rotations on ISS from these five different launch points on Earth. So we have, uh, we have Wallops, we have the Kennedy Space Center, we have um, uh, French Guayana, Kourou, we have Kazakhstan, and we have Japan. I mean, that's, that's really impressive if you think of it that way. Here's a future Mars campaign with robotic precursors. So the idea is that we're, we're probably, we are going to send humans to Mars, but before we really pick the place, we're going to scout out uh, perhaps the top three candidates using robotic precursors, and that's what you see in the upper right. The lunar outpost at the South Pole scenario in the lower left is very similar, I think, to Artemis and the lunar village, with the exception that the gateway isn't shown here. And then my absolute favorite campaign is in the lower right. This is what we call lunar global exploration. It's a nomadic scenario where you basically have a human crew land, for example, at the South Pole and then traverse the lunar surface uh, carrying their habitat, their pressurized rover and the ascent stage with them, uh, Winnebago style, <laughs> okay? And so everything is, uh, you carry everything along, you stop at a certain point and then you, you launch from that point with the ascent stage back to lunar orbit. The next mission lands where the last mission uh, left off. So all the equipment is there, and now they do another leg. And then over the course of you know, n, n, uh, n different missions, you arrive with a different crew at the North Pole. And so in the course of doing that, you've been able to explore the whole uh, front side of the moon. Clearly very ambitious, uh, hugely exciting, also risky to be sure, but uh, wouldn't that be exciting? So when we look at the numbers, um, the numbers are pretty impressive in terms of nodes, edges, the number of missions that we would need, the number of events, and I'm using events here in the narrow sense of SpaceNet. So an event is a landing, is a docking, is an undocking, offloading of supplies, et cetera. 
the element types, the number of instantiated elements or vehicles, and then the duration of the whole campaign. So ISS resupply, uh, 1920 days. That's actually more now after 20 years. Um, the lunar outpost campaign, a neo sortie to an asteroid. And then you can see the Mars exploration campaign is the longest, uh, about 6,900 days. These are Earth days, not souls, by the way. <laughs> Just to be clear on this. So campaigns involve hundreds of events and vehicles over thousands of days. Bringing everything from Earth is not sustainable. And we need to start thinking of this as a supply chain network in space. If you don't do that, uh, probably you will not be successful and it won't be sustainable for the long term. So um, the question then is, so this is following that story. Uh, well, uh, if we think of it as a network, it turns out there's a ton of combinations and ways in which we could travel, uh, where we could get resources, how we process and store those resources. So the question is, um, how do we select an optimal logistics network for space? And you see here the Earth, Moon, Mars network, including the uh, Deimos and Phobos, which are shown definitely not to scale here. Um, and, and this is a static picture, but in your mind, you have to imagine that these, these nodes are constantly moving, but in a very predictable pattern. So in SpaceNet, you have to basically manually define your network. So the question we ask here is, is it actually possible to do optimization like we do in, in terrestrial supply chains? And the answer is yes, but it requires a bit of um, heavy lifting mathematically. And so to do this, um, there's a methodology that we developed called generalized multi-commodity network flows. It, it's a mouthful, I apologize. And the acronym is probably not the best, <laughs> GMCNF. Nevertheless, um, basically the idea is that you have outflows and inflows into each node. And these could be multi-commodity, meaning vehicles, fuel, the crew as, as well. But certain rules have to be adhered to, like mass balance, um, flow transformation, flow concurrency, and then bounds on these flows. And so it turns out these three matrices, A, B, and C, you can define them to fully identify what's possible and what's not possible, including the use of in situ resources, which you model through graph loops. These are loops of a node pointing to itself. And then multigraph allows you to look at multiple types of propulsion or multiple trajectories. So using that approach, um, we, we found some interesting things. Um, for example, we, this is a paper that we published in uh, Journal of Spacecraft and Rockets in 2016. We found that uh, maybe going to Mars directly is not the best option. Maybe you might wanna consider doing a detour to the moon uh, via the Earth Moon L2 point, for example. And why would you do that? Well, because the lunar um, gravity well is so shallow and we can get oxygen on the moon. Um, there's no atmosphere to speak of, but you could get oxygen from the metal oxides or from you know uh, ice in the permanently shaded regions. Uh, now you need an infrastructure for that. You need to mine that oxygen. But if you could actually bring that oxygen to an in-space depot, um, we've shown that you could save up to 68% mass, in, injected mass in low Earth orbit relative to the current uh, Mars DRA 5.0. And that's huge. I mean, that, that, that paper and I think the, the news coverage from that um, uh, really uh, got a lot of attention. Uh, we were also criticized for some of the assumptions to be sure, but I think a lot of the appetite for lunar resources uh, was at least in part uh, triggered by this paper. Now, one of the tricky things is your ISRU, if you do go for a uh, ISRU kind of strategy, that technology has to be really good and really reliable. Because if it's not working, then you're better off just launching from Earth, especially with uh, falling launch prices. Um, so the chart on the upper right is a technology sensitivity analysis where we looked at how good does the ISRU resource extraction technology have to be 
in terms of kilograms per year per kilogram of plant mass. So 10, which was the baseline, means what? 10 means that a one ton uh, ISRU plant can produce 10 times its own weight per year in useful mass. And I think clearly at this point, we are, uh, we are not at that point. And so if you degrade the ISRU resource production rate, so from the right to the left, uh, you can see it looks like a zigzag curve because for each productivity level of the technology, we re-optimize the network, okay? And so that's why it looks like a, not like a smooth curve, but like a zigzag curve. And you can see if you, if you go below 3.5, in terms of ISRU productivity, uh, lunar ISRU uh, is not attractive. Uh, it, it, interestingly, Mars ISRU is very attractive, even at relatively low levels of uh, ISRU productivity. And that's because it's so far away, there's such a high delta V to get to Mars that Mars ISRU is, is pretty much a no brainer, even with, with somewhat um, immature technology. And, uh, and that basically brings me to just mention Moxie to you. I'm sure you've all heard about it. Jeff is the co-PI for it. And uh, it was very exciting to see the landing and, um, and um, uh, to, to hopefully uh, have Moxie work and show that we can extract oxygen uh, uh, from, from the lunar atmosphere. And one of the things that uh, that I really enjoyed is, is collaborating with Jeff and um, uh, Eric Hinterman, one of the PhD students in, in Jeff's lab, on what a scaled up version of MOXIE would have to look like to optimally produce oxygen, trading off essentially mass and power. And so this is a block diagram of what the system looks like. You have to compress the CO2. You have to put it through a heat exchanger and heat it up. Uh, then you, you, you separate the CO2 molecules, uh, you discard the carbon monoxide, which is not that useful, and you, you retain the oxygen, uh, probably in a liquefied state. Um, and it turns out that, you know, if you do this at scale, at large scale, there's a lot, it's very power hungry. Uh, and so uh, that's probably one of the biggest constraints. And there's some really cool trade-offs in terms of using different heat exchangers or not using them. Uh, to reduce the power, but you're doing that at the expense of the plant mass. So there's a lot more research to be done here. So I think I'm... Um, uh, since you gave some numbers, just, just to fill in the numbers for, for Moxie, <laughs> its, its mass is about uh, 6.3 kilograms. And uh, if it produces uh, 10 grams per hour, which it <laughs> do with, if we run about a little over three amps through it, you'll get about 82 kilograms per year. That's if we ran it continuously, of course, which we are not, we can't do be, because we have to share with other instruments. But so it's it's well over the factor of 10 that, that you um, mentioned as being viable for a real ISRU system. That, and that's, you know, that's really encouraging. Um, because in some sense, the, the atmospheric, the gas processing is low hanging fruit compared to extracting oxygen from regolith. Uh, and then, you know, we'll have to see about the ice, right? Subsurface ice or PSR ice. But um, one thing, Jeff, that's really encouraging. There's a hot debate always about, well, you're not including the mass of the power system in that. Um, so you're, you're just assuming you get power for free, but, um, you're sharing the power system with other functions. So what fraction of the power system would you have to include in the plant mass to really be fair, right? That's a, that's a big debate always. <laughs> that, of course, is, is a basic principle in, in ECLIS in general is that uh, you have to use, uh, you know, effectively uh, what we call the effective mass because, uh, you know, as you say, if you need extra power to run any part of your ECLIS system, you've got to include that as part of the system mass. And the, the same thing, you know, if it, if it produces heat and you have, have to then have a more massive heat dissipation system, really you have to charge that back to ECLIS. So when we, when we deal with ECLIS mass, you have to actually uh, use the concept of effective mass and not just actual mass. Right, right, exactly, exactly. 
So, um, so let me just summarize here. Um, paradigm shift is underway from mission centric, you know, one mission at a time thinking to network a network centric approach. That's by the way, true for communications as well, right? With Starlink and, and uh, using um, Mars probes as relays for each other. But I think it's gonna apply to mass and energy as well. Network centric thinking, please. Uh, pioneering space with humans will uh, rely on a combination of traditional technologies, you know, LOX hydrogen propulsion, but more efficient and new technologies like in-situ resource utilization and advanced ECLIS. And then the big question is there uh, nuclear thermal rockets, yes or no? Um, we've shown that by, by doing this kind of new thinking, new approach, we can, we can do much, much better than, than the classic campaigns like Mars DRA 5.0. And a ton of research is needed. That's why I think this class is so exciting. You know, the LOA approach uh, is, is because it, it, it's gonna help us demonstrate and answer a lot of these questions. What are the technology sensitivities and thresholds for ISRU that we need to hit for it to be worthwhile? Um, what is the role of solar electric propulsion? Is it only for cargo? Probably because it's slow. Uh, what happens if launch costs from Earth fall dramatically? Elon Musk has made a lot of promises and some great accomplishments, but it's not a factor of 10 right now. It's a factor of three to four. Uh, and certainly isn't a factor of 100. So at what point when the launch, what is the critical threshold for launch costs in order to just launch things from Earth willy nilly? Uh, technology covariance matrices. What does the technology portfolio look like? Um, remote sensing. How do we find these resources and do technology demonstrations like MOXIE? And then uh, what are the international legal frameworks? Can you just go and uh, not just plant a flag, but harvest these resources and claim them as your own and use them as part of your space logistics supply chain um, at some point, there will be conflicts and contention because of that. So this is the picture I showed you. This is not me. This is Jeff uh, on Devon Island in the Arctic, oops, uh, in 2005, uh, which was a really cool expedition. This is July, by the way. This is not the winter. Snow in July. Uh, and if you look closely, you can see some tents in the upper right of this picture. And so... Um, I should have taken this picture a little more carefully. But anyway, this is a, this is a uh, I don't know, a 15-year journey, journey of space logistics compressed into 40 minutes. So I apologize for the fire hose, but this is MIT, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Professor Dramek. This is fantastic. I think we have time for one or two quick questions from the class. And um, you can go ahead and unmute yourselves and jump in. Lieutenant William, I see your hand is raised. Thank you very much. Uh, that was an awesome presentation. Definitely learned a lot. I uh, just had a few quick questions. Um, so for the math background that you're showing earlier for the logistics, is that currently scalable um, and uh, able to be constantly updated similar to how space surveillance is done now uh, or space object tracking? And uh, you know, like, will there have to be like uh, automated task managers, et cetera? And the second question is, will we, will we reach the network of horse and buggy stage first, or will we reach that first frontier of high thrust nuclear propulsion prior to reaching that full network centric logistics model? Thanks. Uh, great question. So scalability, um, it's basically the A, B and C matrices that need to be populated. And, you know, we've done A, A matrices uh, as large as 10,000 by 10,000, which is quite large. Uh, but the, the good news is these are pretty sparse matrices. If you think about a space logistics network, it not every node connects to every other node, right? We have these trajectories. And so the actual non-zero entries in these matrices are fairly sparse. So if we're clever, we use the sparse, you know, linear algebra, 1806, great class, by the way. Uh, linear algebra use sparse, sparse uh, algorithms that exploit the, the, the sparsity of these, these, these mathematics. That would be my, my first answer. Um, the second one, um, uh, remind me again, the second question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what you were talking about 
not only Ritu network logistics, but also the, uh, you know, the forefront of nuclear high thrust propulsion technology, effectively, which one's going to hit first? Because, you know, there'll be impacts on which one. Yeah, I think I think we are not going to skip the horse and buggy stage. <laughs> I think I think we are, uh, especially if Moxie is successful. Uh, uh, methane also, you know, um, so uh, liquid oxygen, methane production, uh, hydrogen production, electrolysis, all of those processes will allow us to create fuel and oxidizer at these nodes, and. Uh, you know, that's, that's very attractive uh, instead of, so the, the, the nuclear is extremely capable, of course, nuclear thermal rockets are very capable, but if you include the policy problems of launching them and so forth, I think we're gonna, we're probably gonna rely on, on chemical and solar electric propulsion just for the cargo uh, for many years to come. I think for, for the outer solar system, for the outer solar system exploration, we probably are going to have to use nuclear, but that's you know that's maybe fifty or more years in the future. And any final questions for Professor Debeck? Just to put things in perspective, um, I'd, I'd like the people in the class to sort of imagine themselves back in the heroic age of Antarctic exploration that, that Professor Devec referred to. And what do you think Amundsen or, or Shackleton or Scott would have said if you told them that someday we would have a permanent scientific base at the South Pole? They would have thought you were absolutely out of your mind. You can't do it because of the logistics. You know, you have dog sleds and, and you just can't take that amount of stuff. And, and as, as Professor Devec said, it was the development of the improvement of transportation, which allowed the logistics, that is uh, Arctic uh, and Antarctic uh, air travel, that really was the game changer. And, and that's hopefully what we're looking for in lunar and ultimately Mars exploration is when we when we improve the logistics capability, that's when the, the game changes and we can really move from the Apollo era to uh, actually having a, a, a sustainable scientific base on the moon. So we're on that cusp right now. It's, a, it's an exciting time to be getting involved in lunar operations. So uh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, when we started this work in 2005, JPL and us uh, submitted this proposal called Interplanetary Supply Chain Management. And we were sure, absolutely sure, that this was going to get rejected at NASA headquarters. Who would fund a project with taxpayer money on interplanetary supply chain management? It's ludicrous. But we didn't get rejected, which really was great and surprising. And now, 15 years later, it's, it seems normal, right? Where commercial resupply of ISS, the CLIPS program, all the things you're learning in this class, it's like, yeah, it's cutting edge, but it's, it's becoming accepted and normal. And, and there's startup companies and other countries are jumping in. That was not the case 15 years ago, trust me. Well, if the class can please give a warm thank you to Professor Devec, we really appreciate you coming in today. Thank you very much. And uh, I believe Professor Devec may be able to stay through to the end of class. Uh, I'm happy to, I'm Wonderful. happy to. Thank you so much. So you'll get another chance to ask some questions and we'll have a conversation um, for the second half of class today.